Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, maybe for certain. Um, thanks for joining us uh, today and to talk about a, a very important topic around biodiversity. Um, we have uh, about a half an hour chat um, planned for today. Um, we'll be using the the Q and A function in the Zoom, so feel free to jump in and and ask some questions in the Q and A. Uh, we'll either kind of get them as they go, or we'll leave some time at the very end. Um, and that's the plan. Um, the topic today is specifically around biodiversity in the real estate sector and how that's making its way into standards. And it's uh, um, an extremely for me, anyways, an extremely important topic, um, and uh, we'll get into it in a second. But it's been almost uh, ten years now that we've been kind of working working towards this this direction. Um, the reason uh, biodiversity is a topic for us today, and it's a bigger topic in real estate right now, is is mainly because of uh, the TNFD, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, that just came out uh, last September, came out with their um, real estate specific uh, guidance this year, um, and They've identified the real estate sector as a, as a material uh, topic, and uh, as biodiversity and being a material topic for the real estate sector. And the way they frame it, there's a great quote in some of the TNFD documentation, is that the built environment is responsible for around 30% of all biodiversity loss across the globe. So it's huge. Once you start uh, putting all these buildings together, uh, these are massive footprints and do have a big impact on biodiversity, uh, and there's ways to, to change that. So TNFD is rapidly kind of surpassing the adoption of TCFD. It's, it's going really quickly. And CSRD has also um, kind of uh, added a section around biodiversity and GRESB as well, which is the uh, global um, real estate benchmark. And so that's why we're going to talk about uh, today is specifically how GRESB is adopting biodiversity in the assessment, how it's kind of already done it and what's on the roadmap. And to discuss that with us today, we have Dan Winters. Uh, Dan, I'll uh, throw it to you and I'll let you introduce uh, introduce yourself for the for the crowd. Alex, so great to be here. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dan Winters. I'm senior director at Gresb. Been with the organization for a decade. Gresb is celebrating its 15th anniversary this year, and we are the ESG benchmark that's used globally on an annual basis on the real estate side. We closed our assessment on July 1st this year, set another record, 2,200 portfolios, 200,000 plus buildings. It's basically the who's who of private equity globally that participates in the assessment and are members of the benchmark, along with roughly 400 listed companies. We call them REITs. So we've got a, a good membership base that's focused on advancing the industry, uh, using their portfolios to move forward on energy, water, waste, greenhouse gas emission data. Biodiversity certainly is a topic of, of uh, forward conversation. Nice. Thanks, Dan. And uh, thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, it's been uh, nice to work. Uh, I guess we got to know each other a year ago now, it's been nice to to uh, to to um, chat and get to know each other, and um, happy that we're talking about this topic and getting uh, finally this out there for for people. And um, myself, I'm going to be educating for sure for me personally. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm Alex McLean. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Alveol. Um, we, as I said, have been kind of in the biodiversity and nature space for real estate for now ten years. Um, I'm a beekeeper myself, so started keeping bees when I was about 15 years old. Uh, so I've been kind of around the world of, of uh, I'll say, insects and bees uh, for a long time. And uh, for the last 10 years at Alveol, kind of building out um, what we think is kind of the future of cities and, and bringing more nature into cities and making that more of a, of a cohesive space um, again. The agenda for today, we're going to talk quickly about uh, Alveol and Grez, just a very quick introduction. I think most of you joining will probably know us uh, or, or one of us, so, so we'll, we'll go quickly towards that. We'll jump then into Grez, what's kind of currently happening um, in the assessment with biodiversity, which um, is, um, you know, in, in a small section of the assessment. Um, but we'll just kind of go over it and Dan's going to talk us through a, lot, a little bit of that. And then we'll go into the roadmap um, and talk through kind of the foundation and GRASB and how um, how decisions are taken around new topics and how biodiversity made its way in there. And then we've kept a small case study for the end here. We'll talk, we'll talk through um, 
kind of how this could be adopted in the in the real estate uh, space. So so stay stay at least till that uh, so we can talk through some some concrete kind of examples. So that's the plan. Um, quick alveol introduction for those that don't know us. Um, so as I said, we, we've been around for about 10, 11 years. We work on about 2,200 buildings across the US, Canada, uh, UK, France, Belgium, um, Netherlands, and Germany. Um, we focus on kind of installations, on-site installations for pollinators um, and work so that we can create more environmental education and, and activities with tenants. Um, but more recently, I've also um, um, started tracking a lot more data coming out of those installations. So biodiversity and nature data that we can use to action and align with the frameworks at TNFD. Um, and we work with a lot of the kind of leading um, um you know, uh, customers uh, in the real estate space um, uh, globally. Um, that's done for us. Uh, Dan, I'll send you uh, on your side. So so maybe talk through, uh, you've kind of given us already a bit of an introduction on GRESB. Um, and then maybe for those that already know GRESB, uh, maybe a bit um, of kind of key recent updates. I know the the results are about to come out. So anything that's kind of new and interesting in the grass world that, that might be interesting for asset managers to, or ESG managers on the call to, to learn. Right? I think the most interesting thing is metrics around biodiversity from, you know, from, from bees. This is, this is really why I'm interested in this webinar. So um, Gresb is set up as, as I'm going to call it the North Star, right? Global best practices on ESG, energy, water, waste, and greenhouse gas emission data are the big drivers, but there's certainly a lot more. It's structured non-financial data that goes to inform how the financials came about. We were started in 2009 by a group of institutional investors, the place where fund managers, the big private equity firms go to get their capital. And these groups are very interested in risk adjusted returns, as well as, you know, they, they have a very long focus because their duration is 30, 40, 50 years for pensioners that they uh, are investing on behalf of. Uh, so they think in serious long term, uh, you know, time horizons of which biodiversity, to your point, Alex, about it being, you know, 30 percent plus uh, impacted by the real estate industry totally material. So in 2009, we got together and we uh, formed this benchmark and it has continued to progress the industry. And in the fourth bullet here, we also do this for infrastructure, for real assets. And so we can talk a little bit about how biodiversity is currently in the real estate assessment. It's sprinkled in the ideas to integrate this into other areas within GRES policies and procedures and data management systems things like that that can track um, elements around biodiversity. But boy, if you look at the infrastructure asset assessment, this biodiversity is already defined as a material issue. And there's an entire question about that and, and having the firms that do the asset level assessment be able to track and deliver metrics on biodiversity to its investors. That's one of the ideas behind GRESP. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk through that a little bit. So, yeah. so you, you were saying uh, um, in you so different assessments for different kind of asset types, and um, more present right now on the infrastructure side, but is present also on the real estate side. And as you said, that kind of evolves over time, right? That's the concept of the assessment: is that as the standards evolve, more and more topics find their way inside of it, right? Correct. So, what I did in, in advance, I, I took a look at the assessment, the the real estate assessment. Question number one, do you have policies, right? So the the way that GRESB is set up is it's a Boolean question. We've got components, aspects, and indicators. A component is management, performance, development. An aspect would be something like policies or stakeholder engagement or energy efficiency, some sort of big thematic under ESG. And then an indicator is a specific question. So right out of the gate, question number one, do you have ESG policies? Yes or no? Most organizations can answer yes. It's a Boolean question. Well, once you do, a long list of checkboxes show up top of the order, biodiversity and, and, and habitat. So that forces companies to think about these issues, whether or not they should have a policy on something like that, and to create one. So that's a measure of how this is infused within GRESB. And people receive points for doing 
some, you know, the, the, the things around having policies. So do you get points for having a biodiversity policy? Not necessarily a bright line, but you certainly have points for policies of which biodiversity could be an element. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, cool. And so, so, so it's in other places. I actually wrote down a couple just to make yeah, sure that we them all. New acquisition due diligence, right? Biodiversity is very important to that. Ongoing risk assessments within your existing portfolio, absolutely. And then elements of employee training, making sure that you've got a competent workforce to consider these issues, right? So these are examples of where this is infused within GRESB currently. Okay. Um, and I think that's, I mean... We're seeing it also across the different frameworks too, which which uh, um, uh, show that that biodiversity really kind of impacts different things, so, you know, such as property values and and, and tent retention, all that stuff. So it's, so it's normal, I think, that it would find its way inside the the assessment. Um, let's talk a little bit about how that might evolve over time. There's a there's the um, I guess the Grez Foundation, right, that comes up with the different topics and that has a roadmap in the in the future. Can you talk us through a little bit, kind of? Um, you know, 2024, this was uh, biodiversity was one of the material topics uh, as part of the roadmap for 24. Um, curious to hear kind of how that set up the difference between the foundation and GRASB um, and, and how that kind of functions around this like roadmap setting every year, right? Perfect. So the GRASB Foundation owns the assessment and the IP behind the standard. It's governed by a group of institutional investors. There's 13 on the board. And then below it, there's committees for real estate infrastructure, and there will be other committees uh, you know, forming based upon different products that Grez pass. So from that, this is where the, the governance of the standard happens. So Alex, as much as this is a tremendous idea and we've got TNFD and, and, and there's all sorts of things outside of Grez pushing in this direction, we still have processes and procedures that we need to go through in order to insert things within the assessment, hence the roadmap. So in 2024, uh, a subgroup within the governance committees were tasked with various topics. Biodiversity was one of those. So we're seeing some of those uh, screenshots of the development topics on top for 2023, and then also for 2024, and you can see biodiversity is in there. What's happened, and the Grez Foundation just had a, uh, a meeting yesterday, so I saw the meeting notes that'll be published in, I don't know, 30 days or so. And the, the efforts that have taken so, place so far in 2024 are researching the topic, trying to wrap our arms around, you know, what not only is TND, TNFD after, but then how to elevate metrics or how to identify metrics that are material and, and determine ways to infuse them within the standard. This is a process that typically takes two years. So the fact that we've been uh, doing literature reviews and having it be part of committees where people are bringing their ideas and their own interventions that are happening in the marketplace to bear right now. And we saw on the slide a moment ago with all of the logos or, or the listing of the clients that you use on or that you have on the bottom, well, they're all members of the benchmark and they use GRESP. So we're getting this loop that comes in that says, okay, here are the issues. Here's some ways that we might be able to track metrics. But as you and I both know, it's difficult. I think that I'm excited by this conversation because my understanding is you've got a workforce in the millions to try to elevate some S metrics and bring them back to the hive so we can see what's going on around the buildings. Yeah. By the workforce, the millions, you're talking about our, our bees, right? I am. You bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And that's exactly what, we, what we've been doing, right? Is, is using that information that the millions of bees gather to, to bring back to that hive and then make, make a, an analysis on, on how, um, uh, how um, diverse essentially the, the, the environment around the building is. And then we can benchmark that with other buildings. And uh, that's what we, when we started uh, chatting for the first time, Dan, I think it was, uh, through customers of ours, right, that have been doing this now for a couple of years and said, well, you have to speak to Dan and Grez because that's that's exactly what they do, right? Um, I, I want to just go back on the foundation for a second. So um, it's interesting how TNFD, which is very much investor-led, and that's what we're hearing from a lot of our customers, is that it's it's uh, they're getting the first questions from their investors and the ESG groups are getting those first questions from investors around, you know, what are they doing for TNFD? 
And, and Gresb has a similar approach in the foundation where it's investor led in terms of what they want to see come out of the assessment, right? So am I, am I framing that in the right way or? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, any, um, any hot gossip you can share about the 2025 roadmap for, um, for, um, uh, the Gresb foundation? <sighs> Hot gossip? No, it, it, no, it's just a process, right? It's a process. And, and you know, our job is to be that uh, sort of North Star guiding light, uh, bringing new issues into the benchmark. And so that's exactly what this is. It's typically a two-year change cycle where, you know, we, we need to talk about it and then we need to put some things out there. If and when a question shows up, and we had one last year that was new, and it was about a net zero energy or actually ghg emission target so we'll ask a new we'll, we'll bring a new question we'll put it into the assessment does the organization does the fund does the firm have a net zero ghg emission target yes or no and then if so describe it a little bit and there's some ways to do that that question last year was unscored that puts the industry on notice that in the following year it will have points associated with it I'm using that as an example for biodiversity, because ultimately what will happen is something will, will be put into the GRESB assessment specific to biodiversity, whether it's in 2025 or 2026. And when it's there, it's going to show up on scored, meaning that every, the, the, the members of the benchmark will be on notice to think about these issues, start to move forward and, and, and show some leadership. And then in 2020, in the following year, it will be scored. And what we're looking for is good, better, best on that issue in the industry in action under performance for sure. Okay. So if you, if you uh, draw a line to kind of previous points that were brought into the, to the assessment, uh, I guess it's it's a uh, it's good practice to start collecting some of this data, and obviously I'm talking about biodiversity in advance of this actually showing up in the assessment, so that uh, funds are ready to actually re um, report and disclose on this, right? Exactly. Ex yeah. Well put. Okay. Um, I want to move to a quick case study here. You, so you mentioned the millions of of bees here, um, and this is one that I really like because it's a building that that you and I. Um, both really know well the teams there, but I think globally is 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 really well known too, right? And um, I'm so glad you chose it. This is actually where we're going to have our Gresb results event this year in the Americas, November 14th uh, at the Empire State Building. And that will celebrate 15 years of industry progress. Wow, okay. Good good plug. So November 14th. How, how long has uh, the Empire State been part of the Gresb assessment? Do, do you know? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident they're 10-year members. Okay. And so one of the, you know, the, the REITs, the listed property companies started to show up in the Gresb assessment back in 2012 and 2013 in our membership base. And it started to take off. We had some leaders and I think some of your other uh, um, clients are longstanding Gresb members on the listed side. And once you get the leaders in the benchmark, the others start to follow. So Empire State Realty has been around a long time. They're one of the, the there's a lot of lead building case studies with Empire State Realty Trust. So you've got a great client on your hands for sure. Nice. Um, I'll talk through a little bit with the ESG team there pushed through, and, and this is kind of out of their ESG report around biodiversity. Um, and just, this is 23 reports. So it's only kind of what they did with the beehives, but they've actually started doing a lot more. Um, you mentioned the millions of bees. So ESRT rolled out and and decided to cross their entire Manhattan portfolio to, to bring uh, kind of pollinator installations. And they did it for a few reasons. Um, there was the tenant uh, side of it, which which is interesting because um, not a lot of um, you know uh, environmental initiatives necessarily have a tenant uh, component to them. And nature, nature and biodiversity do right. There's there's we're drawn to nature. There's something kind of part of our DNA that that kind of seeks out nature. And so having that on side on on top of commercial buildings, I think uh, makes a lot of sense considering the amount of people that go into those buildings every day. And so they. Um, use that both on the workshops and and tenant side, but also on the tracking side, which is more relevant to our conversation today. Um, and and what I think will find its way um, in the GRES assessment in the future, and that's using uh, pollinators to capture uh, eDNA data. So what happens is you have bees that go out 
um, and capture, you know, many uh, particles of everything that's that's alive across, uh, you know, uh, uh, around the building. So that could be trees, shrubs, soil, water. Um, and they bring back that they bring back that information in, um, in the hive. And when we run uh, eDNA, which is essentially um, kind of a um, it's an environmental DNA, so it's it's looking at all the nature elements that are inside uh, that sample. We get uh, information around the floral diversity, the invertebrate diversity, uh, pesticides we can even do now. And so uh, the Empire State has kind of kicked this off this year and, and using the portfolio buildings to capture uh, data around nature so that they can then use that uh, to, uh, you know, action some, some, some key things that will make the environment a, a bit better. And, you know, I mentioned that and that was kind of a bit of a plug for us here, but I think it aligns with, with the methodology and the kind of, uh, you know, philosophy even of GRAS, where as you track data, you start to action that data and you start to make the portfolio buildings more more interesting, right? I'm, I'm well, curious- That's if... what makes this conversation so interesting to me, right? The fact that you can collect data and from the hive uh, to understand the biodiversity around the building is a pretty amazing step forward. Yeah, and um, a big step compared to what exists today, which is sending people to take photos one time in the year with a very, very little information around, um, you know, uh, seasonal differences, which you get when you do this environmental DNA sampling, because you get, uh, you know, essentially a sample from the, from the whole year. Um, um, do you have examples uh, that come up to mind then of, of, you know, buildings or, or not buildings, sorry, funds that, you know, embarked in the Grez journey started out with potentially a kind of lower score, but as they kind of started to do the assessment, really changed how they how they tackle um, um, sustainability in their in their portfolio? Oh, Alex, that's like a softball question. That's been my career, right? So so normal so oftentimes when somebody joins Grez for the first year and they do this assessment, they are going to showcase their random acts of sustainability. We've got a lead building here. We've got an energy star building here, and they're going to bring these forward and they're going to show them off. And that's great. And that's exactly what we're looking for, except we're looking for a program. And so the behavioral change is what I've come around to that, that Grez promotes, which are, these are best practices globally. You put yourself in a peer context and benchmark yourselves against others in the same property type in the same region, and you receive a score. If your score is great, you're like, oh man, we are doing really well. And it reinforces the fact that you have a program, but there's always more work to do. You can't win ESG. And so even if you're scoring in the upper 80s, low 90s, and you're a Gres five-star, you've got more work to do. On the other side of the equation is somebody typically in their first or second year where they're just kind of getting started. They're learning the language. They don't have their arms around data, especially energy, water, waste, and greenhouse gas emission, you know, and, and the biodiversity is like the next frontier. And so those folks are using the framework to curate a program and advance it. And they're going to get up to the three, four, five star range for sure. Take some time, typically, you know, three years to get your sea legs and probably five years before you're really hitting your stride. Some organizations have been getting Grez ready. So I think it's accelerating in the time uh, sequence is, is, is shortening. But either way, everybody's kind of been on that similar journey of understanding what the language is, understanding what the issues are that matter to the LPs, structured non-financial data, and going about putting systems, processes, and procedures in place to track it and share it. I can't, I can't help but draw a parallel with, with uh, even specifically the case study we have here, but, but something we see across the board where similar, um, you know, similar things happen where they'll, uh, um, uh, you know, a specific building as part of the portfolio will invest in biodiversity and potentially do, you know, only a kind of first beehive on a roof uh, and have a very small program around it. Um, and then gradually that changes. And this is a perfect example, but we see it across, you know, a lot of our customers where suddenly we're across the whole portfolio. Suddenly we're tracking a lot more data. Suddenly we're actioning that data. Suddenly we're changing, you know, policies around pesticide use around the building. So um, I love, and when we started talking uh, originally around, um, I think a year ago around Grasp, I love this idea of the this kind of snowball effect and kind of growing and it's starting and taking people where they are, but then gradually getting them to a place where uh, they're doing a lot more, right? 
So Alex, in your experience, question for you, is there, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Economies of location? Like, does it pay to have multiple beehives within blocks of one another? Does it, or, or do you see that? Do you also see potential for um, what I'll call building owners of different companies coming together and sharing their data? I mean, well, how is this playing out in your world? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, the, the answer there is is maybe a little technical, but it comes down to the type of installation that we do at a site. And so we mention a lot beehives, but actually um, a big chunk of what we do in, as installations are, um, it's a little bit different, it's called a bee home. And that's mm -hmm. essentially hosting wild bees on, on site. And the reason that's important is that one, you want to kind of support all types of bees. Uh, um, and so that's, uh, you know, important in terms of supporting the diversity of bees. But the reason why it's really interesting from a biodiversity perspective is that the flight radius is much shorter. And so what we compare is beehives that go two or three miles around the building. So give you more of a broader sense of how kind of the, 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 um, the city's doing or that neighborhood is doing and there that's kind of the link to your question right of that in that case you get kind of um uh information that's collected sometimes in in, in duplicate but when you do the the wild bee home installation then you get only about 100 or 150 feet so then you really get what's happening at the building and mm -hmm. what we're doing is, is comparing those two sets of data and uh building essentially a, a kind of biodiversity benchmark and saying what is um in your area. So what is in the neighborhood in terms of floral diversity, invertebrate diversity, the types of harmful molecules that we're finding in terms of pesticides um, and a bunch of other data that we throw in there. And then what are we getting at your site specific? And that's really where the Delta becomes interesting because that's what you can do at that building to make it in more interesting for biodiversity. And you can compare that with a benchmark of your city. And you can't really compare that with a benchmark globally, right? Because biodiversity is very different in London than it is in New York or in Los Angeles, right? Those are those are very different um, environments. But you can very much compare within those environments uh, kind of how a building is performing based on another one. So when you talk about benchmark and all that, that's really what we're trying to do from a biodiversity standpoint is say, here's the data we have from the beehives. Uh, because they're covering this larger radius, uh, we throw in also some geospatial data in there so we can calibrate and make sure we have everything in, in, you know, very accurate. And then we'll compare that with the site-specific data, give you the delta, and give you recommendations so you can get to a positive place, I guess. That's amazing. I, I will tell you, coming into this webinar, I went to the Grez website and I used the spyglass in the upper right and I searched biodiversity. 20 different mm, articles from partners came up, you know, articles on TNFD, why this is important. I got to say biodiversity is definitely all the buzz and no pun intended, but I, I couldn't help it. Um, thank you for your leadership on this. There was a slide, I think it was the, the slide a moment ago, talking about the S metrics. That's what's going to be the challenge. And I think that you've got a solution here that's very appealing to you know the industry writ large for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, thanks for the kind words, uh, Dan. Um, okay, we're we're at the kind of uh, thirty minute mark here. Um, let's move in, and just before we do move into um, Q and A here, I just want to Dan give you kind of a last uh, chance here. Any anything you would share to people that are listening that that are thinking about biodiversity that have seen it show up in a few places in the assessment that are hearing you talk about it now. Um, any recommendations you would give to, to folks on the call today? Or... Yeah, get educated. We're doing a, you know, a, a good um, literature search. It's topic of the conversation in our governance committees. So it's on the drawing board. It's coming soon. So uh, pay attention to what's happening on TNFD. Think about the interventions that you can make within your properties and in your portfolio and get to work because this will show up in the GRESB assessment and those that are well-versed and ahead will have an advantage. And I'll add to that, um, what's interesting on the biodiversity side or on the nature installation side is, you know, most of the asset managers or ESG managers that we work with, they see the value here on the tenant engagement side and, and really building uh, an interesting experience at the, at the building. And so there's ways to invest in that data already, but not necessarily only for the data, but get get an ROI from a different um, a different aspect too. So there's there's ways to get educated and get prepared and start this at you know a couple of buildings before doing it across the whole portfolio. 
uh, that will already drive value for those buildings and start gathering data um, uh, for future assessments, right? Um, Q and A. So, so we have a few questions here in the Q and A. Um, one one that came up here and is um, how do you get this data from uh, from the hive? Um, the the data. So what what I was mentioning earlier in the conversation here is that as you said, Dan, there's millions of uh, workers here uh, that that go out and visit all of these different live um, elements around the buildings. We talk about trees, shrubs, flowers, pesticides, all these different things that are either live or can affect um, nature, um, and they carry that on their bodies and bring that back inside the hive. And what happens inside the hive is they walk over um, wax um, uh, and, and um, it'll also find itself uh, in the pollen that they they, they, uh, they store. And so when we take a wax and a pollen sample uh, and they do eDNA, we work with uh, a few different labs here that do, do um, the sampling for us. Um, they'll send us back from that sample inside the hive, which is wax and pollen and a bit of honey. Uh, they'll give us the whole floral diversity um, and invertebrate diversity that we can get from the hive. Um, we also will put in different types of, um, of um, uh, sampling methods. So for pesticides, for example, we put a little plastic strip. And because the bees will walk over that plastic strip, we can analyze that strip after and get um, the kind of makeup of, of different uh, potentially harmful molecules around the building. Um, and that, you know, eventually can feed into a policy around uh, reducing those. So the short answer is you sample elements inside the hive, either natural elements like wax, and pollen or unnatural elements like, you know, sample strips uh, that are specifically made for that sample. You take that out, uh, send it to the to to, to our lab, uh, and then we build out a report that is really built out for real estate. So we don't send out raw data. I mean, raw data is available, but we build it out in a report that is actionable and makes sense for someone that's, you know, that owns or operates a, a building. Right? Um, Q&A. This one for you, Dan. It sounds as if there could be a biodiversity question within 25 assessment. Uh, is that accurate? There you go. It's accurate to say the Gres Foundation is investigating how to apply biodiversity into the Gres assessment, and it's an active project. But I'm not able to comment on a time frame. I know that I started talking about years, and it's in this document, and whatnot. Uh, I'm. That's an accurate way to articulate the state of affairs right now, September 4th, 2024. We won't hold you to any, uh, any dates, uh, Dan. <laughs> and it's already pointed, but it's very small points, right? It's a 16th of a point or an eighth of a point as part of these bigger, these bigger categories, right? Yeah. So then you look at your, at our scoring document and you can see yeah. like, this policy that I brought up, right? So biodiversity is one of the elements, but there's a long list of things that the policies can cover. And Alex, what you're referring to is the scoring document where the more things that are within these policies or within, you know, the other elements, ongoing risk assessments or employee training, if biodiversity is an element of those indicators, then you receive credit. The difference is there's not a dedicated question on the real estate assessment having to do with biodiversity. That's the future that I'm projecting, but I'm not confident into what year that happens. I feel like this is a perfect segue for our next um, webinar that we can do once the roadmap comes out. And well, when is the road in October, right? Is when the roadmap comes out? And... Yeah, it's a quarterly, right? Um <laughs> It, it, it's it's a process, right? And, and so we can uh, probably at the end of the year, let's see where things have developed. I'm outside the process. That's why it's kind of difficult for me to make definitive comments about it. Um, I can just kind of watch and watch the notes and see what's published out there. So use the spyglass on our website, type in biodiversity, take a look at the foundation. It's in uh, roadmap when it's republished. It's in draft mode right now. I've added some additional elements on areas that I'm working on, which is the lender side of things and em embedding biodiversity into due diligence questionnaires for a loan. It's an interesting concept. So these are the things that the industry is working on. So stay tuned because we're in the middle of the decade. There's a lot of work to do. And this is definitely on high on the agenda. Okay, great. Um... <clears throat> Another one here for you, Dan, and this will be the last one before we uh, before we close. Scrambling to label methods, be it green, eco. I'm not 
sure what exactly that means. Sustainability is labeling methods. Maybe referring to green building certifications or? There's, uh, I, I think what the spirit of the question is people are focused on net zero. There's hundred trillion dollars that have made net zero commitments by 2050 or before. Great. Well, what exactly does that mean and how do we implement? So net zero is certainly a very high topic, whether it's a building certification, whether it's GRES, but whether it's the UNPRI. <clears throat> Same thing is going to happen on the S with biodiversity. The trick is, what are the metrics? How do we measure them? And then how do we make them actionable to doing interventions going forward? Right. And that's where the art of all of this is. And it's everybody's minds that are coming together and trying to make this progress. So it doesn't feel like a straight line. It doesn't always feel like a, a what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. It's kind of a messy process at times because you got lots of different actors out there all doing things, but we know that these are the important topics. And I think that's the word scrambling in here. That's, that's kind of got me and not sure how to answer this question. Cause I don't think it's a scramble as much as a, we all know it's important. We're all trying to do our things and we're trying to corral everybody so we can stay directionally aligned. Nice. Thank you, Dan. Um, okay, we're at the we're at time. Um, thanks for everyone for uh, for joining. Um, I'll just uh, say if you're interested in speaking um, about biodiversity for a building for a fund, uh, just curious on how it may tie into you know your strategies as a as a real estate owner operator uh reach out to us um we've been doing this for 10 11 years um we're quite close with with Bresb and how things are evolving on that on that side um, um and uh um we're there to help and to uh, make these strategies kind of come alive um uh, for you and there's always a way to start very small um and and just start this as as very small projects so you can see the return uh but if you trust the kind of 22 uh, 100 buildings that we have now, there's a certain uh, interest. And, and uh, as you said, Dan, there's a certain buzz. And I think it's a, it's a worthy one. Uh, thanks, Dan, for, um, for being with us. Very uh, uh, kind to take some time this morning uh, with us. It's been a pleasure. I'm looking forward to the next one, hmm. either late fourth quarter, early first quarter. Let's see how this develops for sure. Okay, so stay tuned. We'll, uh, we'll have that. And then uh, just a quick plug for our next webinar. Um, in a few weeks, uh, we'll be speaking with the team over at Briam um, US and talking about their building certification. So we're we're going obviously from a fund conversation today to more of a building um, conversation. But I think it'll be quite interesting to kind of see and quite concrete there to, to learn about kind of the Briam certification. Briam has always had a biodiversity component or, or has had for a while now. Um, and so interesting to see how they uh, look at that and frame it. So. Uh, stay tuned, September 26th. And thank you. Thank you, Alex. And thank you to all the people that are posting the questions.